Hello, everyone, and welcome to Community Conversations. My name is Luke Margolis. I'm the Corporate Communications Director for Atlantic Health System. And today, I am really excited to be covering a topic that's uh, near and dear to, to my heart, to any Buddy who's had somebody in their family, or maybe they themselves who have uh, had questions about um, uh, breast cancer, breast health, uh, all the ways that we can help women take care of themselves uh, throughout uh, the full year, but definitely during the month of October when we're talking about uh, Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And to do that, I've brought in one of my favorite folks, Dr. Shilpi Gupta. Nice to see you. Hi, Luke. Thank you for having me. Excellent. Uh, Dr. Gupta and I are going to talk for uh, a little bit of time. Now, look, we understand there's a chance we may not fully cover everything you want to hear or any questions you might have. So I strongly encourage you, go to AtlanticHealth.org and check out our website. We've got tons of information on there, everything ranging from different conditions and, and different treatments to Maybe if you're looking to have a, uh, to meet a different physician or to, to create a relationship with a physician because you don't have one yet, you can go to our Find a Doc tab and you can find folks like Dr. Gupta and others all there to help you with any medical needs you might have. All right, Dr. Gupta, that's the lay of the land. Ready to jump in? Yep. Okay. So um, off the beginning, I talked about this being a topic near and dear to folks' hearts. Breast cancer uh, is something that my family has dealt with through relationships with people we've had. Um, it's hard to find a family that uh, hasn't had this type of situation rear its head or had questions about breast health in general, about how we can help women stay healthy. Um, how important is it? Do you think that we're talking about this topic during this month? And and um, and what are some things you're thinking about as we as we come into it? You bring up very relevant and good points, Luke. I don't believe cancer has not touched too many of us one way or the other. So I understand your thought process and the thought process of a lot of our community members and, and family and friends. I am going to bring up some numbers that were published earlier this year by American Cancer Society. Mm -hmm. They predicted and they gave an estimate of cancer numbers for the United States for 2024. Mm -hmm. And the numbers are humbling. For 2024, American Cancer Society estimates over 2 million cancer diagnoses across the United States. 2 million? 2 million. Wow. Over 610,000 cancer-related deaths. Wow. And we are seeing an increased number of cancer in our younger population, less than 50 years of age. Wow. And breast cancer till date remains the single highest reason for breast cancer-related mortality in women younger than 49 years of age. So these numbers are staggering, humbling, and the good thing is that we have tools in place to help our friends, family members, sisters, wives, uh, people that we care about, take care of these issues, early detection, early diagnosis, and save lives. Wow. that You're right. Those numbers are... Um frankly sobering, right? Yeah. When you think about the scope yeah. of, of this and mm -hmm. how many people are affected by it. But I love that you quickly pivoted to this notion of we're not powerless here, mm -hmm. that we have tools and there's things we can do. And and I look, ultimately our goal here is to help people learn a little bit yeah. and, and take action to help themselves. When I have the opportunity to talk to oncologists and you, you're a breast medical oncologist right. here at Atlantic Health System. And when, when I have a chance to talk to oncologists, the one thing that we always start our conversations with is screening, yeah. right? Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about why that's important and what it does for us to empower us to help people. Sure, I'll, I'll try and answer your question in one sentence, which is screening saves lives. It's key in the world of oncology to diagnose things early on. And by things, I mean not just cancer, but even precancerous findings, things that we might not feel as women. I'll share a personal experience with you. My first breast imaging was when I was breastfeeding my daughter 10 years ago. And I can't begin to explain the cascade of emotions that went through me when I realized that at a very young age, I'll probably need to go for an imaging because I felt something. Uh -huh. And 10 years later, I'm glad that I was able to overcome the guilt, the fear, the paranoia, the anger, the frustration that you go through and take the next steps and, 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 and you know, in a way, hopefully be a good role model to my daughter and to my friends and family members and sure. saying, look, you can do this. We all can do this. And a stitch in time saves nine. Yeah. So why do you think that that, that fear exists? I, I've heard some folks say, I just don't want to know. Yeah. I just don't want to know. Is yes. that do you hear that a lot? All the time. I hear wow. it a lot where, um, you know, when you ask friends and family on why you've delayed, the answer is we don't want to know or 
because we didn't feel anything. Right. But the catch is that you don't want to feel anything. Look, the one thing that we should talk about is what really is a screening test versus yeah, a that? diagnostic yeah, a test. Yes. So a screening mammogram, because we're talking mammograms in particular, is a test that we do when there is no symptom. So by the time we start to feel a lump or a mass or have a breast finding, it's no longer a screening, it's a diagnostic test. Right. Screening is done in the complete absence of a symptom because we are trying to get one step ahead. Get ahead of it, Correct. right. We are trying to make sure that we are okay for the now and for the future. So that's the big difference between a screening versus a diagnostic study. So uh, for, for women who are watching this who right. may have n never had a screening or mm -hmm. maybe coming to this or maybe no friends and family who have, but right. just for whatever reason are new to this to this discussion, what's that process like? What what do folks do? How do, how do we at Atlantic Health System provide those types of screenings? Great question again. So at Atlantic, the beauty of the process is that no, you don't need to have a referring physician. You do not need to necessarily go to your primary medical doctor or your surgeon or your GYN to get a mammogram, a screening mammogram. You could, but you don't have to. You don't have to, but you could, correct. It's always good to talk to the physicians or the providers involved in your care. It's always good to have them answer your concerns and your fears. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, our patients can just go on the Atlantic Health website and schedule directly online a screening mammogram. Mm -hmm. If there is any concerning finding on the screening mammogram, the, the patients or the women will automatically get referred to their providers, the surgeons, navigators who will help them navigate the process of the next steps. Because that could be an uphill battle. It's scary. Again, it's an unknown world suddenly, mm -hmm. but there are tools in place. We have radiology navigators that work across the breast imaging centers to guide patients on what's needed next if there is something. We have a breast health navigator who works across my office, the breast surgeon's office, radiation oncology office, very well versed with some of the next steps. And of course, we all have our own primary medical doctors, our GYNs to fall back on, yeah. who have a ton of information, a wealth of information and resources that we can tap into. So what if, if um, for, for women who are trying to figure out their risk, right? Trying right. To, to understand yeah. where they fall into this world mm -hmm. of potentiality. Mm -hmm. um, how important are things like uh, family history? Very important. When we talk about screening mammograms, you know, the usual rule of thumb is you start at the age of 40 and okay. you go for a screening mammogram either once a year or twice a year, depending on what guidelines you're observing. But there are some women who need to start screening early on. That depends on not just the family history, but personal history, subs like chest wall radiation or a genetic history where you have a BRCA mutation or other mutations that increase your risk for breast cancer. Those are conditions that can be discussed or that your providers will help you identify They'll tell you where you fall into the risk hierarchy. And then the thing to bear in mind is that for some of our high-risk patients, we don't stop at a mammogram. Maybe you need to go for an ultrasound along with a mammogram or even couple it with a breast MRI. So there are tools in place for women who have what we call an average risk for mm -hmm. breast cancer mm -hmm. versus women who have somewhat of an increased risk for breast cancer. Okay. And that's why it's important to talk. I mean, I was thinking this morning on... Um, you know, how would I, if I was told to convince somebody into going for a mammogram? Yeah, what's your, your what elevator you pitch? Yeah, right, you're, you're, right? You're, the, yeah, the, the yeah, one like word. That. And I realize it's it's what we and I are doing today. It's about talking. It's about just addressing the big question that everybody has, acknowledging that this is relevant. Breast mm -hmm. health is important. Mm -hmm. and, and not just for two women talking to each other, but for family members, for friends. I saw a patient the other day, young lady with a difficult diagnosis now, and she said, Dr. Gupta, you know what's the first thing I did after I got my information? I called my sister on the phone and told her to go for a mammogram. Oh, and wow. then I called my friend and told her to go for a mammogram. You Th become like evangelical about correct. it. Correct. Yeah. That's half the battle won. And it takes that one person to pick up the phone and talk about it and acknowledge it yeah. to, to convince five more and ten more. And that's what we need to do. And I hope that's what we're trying to achieve today. A hundred percent. Are these, are for, for, me, for women who have never had a mammogram, right. are they... Are they invasive? Are they painful? How easy are they? Does it take your whole day to do it? Is it pretty straightforward <laughs> right. process? It is. Um, 
it's not too complicated. Let's put it like that. At Atlantic, I know, being a consumer myself, that they do accommodate your special needs, your timings, your schedule. As a working woman, sometimes it gets complicated. Sure. So we are committed at Atlantic to accommodate our, our community, our friends and our family members. Um, it, it takes around 30 to 45 minutes. Okay, so it's not an all-day thing. No, and with the new testing tools that we have, with the Tomo mammogram that we have, the number of images are less, so it's less time on machine, oh, okay. better quality. It, it's way better at picking up high-risk lesions versus nothing, especially when you are young and you have dense breasts. Yeah. So is it a little annoying? Yes, it is, but is it worth it? Absolutely. So maybe if you'd had mammograms years ago, but maybe there's maybe you've kind of there's a gap in your history, you haven't quite been on top of it. Right. You might find the experience now to be even easier. A little than, different, correct. Yeah. It is I have I've been through both and I can't tell you it's easier now. You mentioned dense breasts. For yes. women who aren't familiar with what that means, what does that dense mean? Dense breast means that it's it's a radiographic term. And it's the radiologist who will tell us if somebody has dense breast, meaning there's a lot of background noise on the imaging, mm -hmm. which sometimes makes picking up findings difficult. Okay. With the newer techniques, we are at a better place at picking up what's just benign, nothing to worry about, yeah. versus what might be something that needs a second look. All right, let's pick up on that. Um, you you alluded to this a little bit in some of your previous answers, but but just to, to drive it home for folks, um, from a procedural standpoint, let's say something does come up right. on the scan. Um, how do we how do we align our resources around this patient to care for them, and, and what's sort of the next step in their journey if sure. something like that were to come up? So if there is a finding that's concerning on a screening mammogram, the radiologists determine what are some of the next steps. Okay. Typically, it involves something called a diagnostic mammogram, okay. which involves extra views of the breast in question. It could involve a diagnostic ultrasound, again, to fine tune that one spot to see if it's visible on the ultrasound. To or give us it's better, just a better understanding, better understanding of, what's of what's going on. And yeah. then depending, on, oftentimes that's it. Oftentimes when you start doing the diagnostic mammogram and the ultrasound, you realize it's breast tissue. Yeah, we're good to go. We are good to go and you're back to your once a year screening. Sometimes it does translate into need for a biopsy. Okay. And that's where the radiologist and the radiology navigator will tap into your provider, the patient's provider, yep. be it the primary medical doctor, be it the gynecologist, depending on what the bi, again, that might be it. It might be the biopsy, benign, hopefully nothing no more problem. to do, correct. But if there is something more, then our breast health navigator kicks in. That's where she'll reach out to the patient, work with the radiologist, work with the patient to get the patient meet to get the patient to meet our breast surgeon. Mm. And and again, sometimes that's it. You go for surgery, there's nothing to worry about and you're all done. But sometimes it could result in having to meet people like me. I'm a breast medical oncologist. I treat women who have breast cancer or sometimes just high risk lesions, lesions that are not cancerous but that do need attention. Mm. Or Radio, radiation oncology and things like that. But that, that that's the pathway we follow yep. through our navigator. And uh, in terms of the different therapies we can provide, it's it's the things people are familiar with, Ra radiation, surgery, chemotherapy sometimes even, all of, we, 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 in other words, at Atlantic Health, we're able to provide all the different services people at need. At Atlantic Health, I know I'm biased because I'm a part of Atlantic well, Health. <laughs> we'll, give you, we'll give you a pass on, on this one. Thank you. Uh, but I think we are uniquely positioned. I, I love the team that we have at Atlantic. I love the, the support and the resources that we have at Atlantic. As a provider, as a physician, you, you, know, you always put yourself in your patient's shoes and right. you want to make sure that if you were the consumer, you will be happy with what you're getting or are we doing it right by our patients? Yeah. And I think we are uniquely positioned here because of the, the structure that we have in place, right from really good physicians to a very robust support staff with the navigator, to um, the, the nutritionist, the social worker, the, the various programs we run, the mind-body program, you know, we have it all. Yeah. And, and I can say we have it all because, you know, after having taken care of a lot of women, I see the difference we make. Yeah. And, and it's, it's humbling. Yeah, I bet. And satisfying. I bet. I know we have a great um, mentorship program that we do where, where folks who have been have gone through the program and have recovered and want to come back and, and provide mentorship to patients do it. It, it, it really does take a village in yes, that regard, which does. is which mm -hmm. is um, it's pretty incredible to see happen. Um, we're coming down the stretch here. So I want to I want to end a little bit where we began. Sure. Um, 
and the whole point of, of what we're doing here today is to really um, reinforce a key takeaway message for our audience, and that's the power of screening. So yes. let's finish where we began. If you would, one more time, drive home for me. It, when you talk to folks at parties or where, <laughs> wherever you have these conversations, okay. um, how important is that screening, and, and what do you want women to know about going out and getting screened? I cannot emphasize it enough. Early detection saves lives. You know, I'm early when we started, I mentioned pre the statistics with cancer deaths. Early diagnosis of breast cancer is actually life-saving because we are picking things at a very early point. We are treating it at the appropriate stage and we are truly saving lives. The more we delay, the more we are signing up for trouble. So stitch in time saves nine. Screening saves lives, and it's absolutely important as women that we focus on breast health. Dr. Gupta, you're the best. Thanks Thank for doing this. Thank you for having me, Luke. All right, folks. Well, we appreciate you tuning in to this episode, and, and hopefully you heard something there that, um, that you can take with you. Again, if you have any questions or if you just want to learn a little bit more, go to AtlanticHealth.org, and you can search for anything you're looking for on the site. Um, you can find folks like Dr. Gupta, uh, or maybe for any other condition you're looking for, um, as Dr. Gupta said, whether it's breast health or any condition, we're uh, certainly excited to provide any resources we can to help you out. So thanks for tuning in. On behalf of Dr. Gupta, I'm Luke Margolis, and we'll see you next time.